The following message was presented during the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministries 2018 Prophecy Conference season. Now here's Pat Neff with a message from Matthew chapter 24, Christ's Second Coming. The most significant event in biblical prophecy is without question the second coming of Jesus Christ. I want to say to my colleagues, I'm sorry, but I've got the most glorious passage assigned this week. We've been talking about grief, the grief of the tribulation period. We're about to experience glory. Jesus is coming again. We've been talking about terror, tribulation, and tragedy. We're about to get to triumph. Jesus is coming again. In his wonderful book that Steve just mentioned, uh, The End, Mark Hitchcock writes the following, and I quote, he said, newspapers have a special kind of font that they reserve only for mega events when ordinary headlines and bold print just won't cut it. They call it second coming type. It's the kind and size of font that jumps off the page, grabs the reader by the throat, and screams, read me. It's the kind of font they use when Pearl Harbor was attacked, when the Allies defeated Hitler, when President Kennedy was assassinated, and even one of the greatest blunders in American journalism history, Thomas Dewey's defeat of Harry Truman in the 1948 presidential election. Why do they call it second coming type, he asked? Why give this title to the font used for such sensational events? The reason, of course, is that there is simply no bigger event in human history than the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'd like you to open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 24, and I want to begin reading with the 29th verse. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the heavens, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. In our text, the Lord Jesus himself describes his second coming in clear, concise, and straightforward terms. Uh, much of today's world is familiar with the circumstances surrounding our Lord's uh, um, first coming, you know, his birth in Bethlehem, the angels, the uh, shepherds, the wise men, uh, but multitudes, including many professing Christians, know very little about his second coming. And with today's lack of prophetic teaching and preaching, I think it was Mike who said, you know, the, the Bible is 25% prophecy, and all Scripture is profitable. And if we're setting aside 25% of the Bible and not teaching it because it's divisive and hard to understand, uh, well, it, it, it is very, very sad today. The sequence of events that take place at his second coming are nothing less than spectacular. We're going to look at them in just a few moments. But before we look at those events, those spectacular, amazing events that Jesus describes, uh, that, that will take place at his second coming, there are two important foundational truths that we must understand. First of all, Matthew chapter 24, the text that I'm dealing with, the chapter that I'm dealing with, is about Israel and not the church. This is not the church age. Much of the confusion uh, that, that I see about the Various views on the tribulation come from the fact that there are those who do not recognize that Matthew 24 is not about the church. It is about Israel. Secondly, Matthew 24 is not speaking about the rapture. 
The rapture is not found in Matthew 24. The rapture is not about Israel. It is about his return. Matthew 24 is not about the rapture of the church. It is about the return of Jesus Christ to rescue Israel from her foes and to establish the promised Davidic kingdom. Now in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31 that we have just read, Jesus mentions three remarkable events that will accompany his second coming. The first has to do with the solar system. The solar system. Let's pick it up in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, we're coming right to the end now, folks. The tribulation is coming to a close, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. A young man gets engaged, and he goes to the jewelry store to pick out a diamond for his intended. And the jeweler will bring out on a black cloth a brilliant, shining diamond. The black background gives more brilliance to the diamond. Notice that the lights are about about to go out before the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. As Jesus is about to leave the shores of heaven to physically appear and return to earth, there will be amazing signs that will take place in the heavens. Notice that the very heavens will be shaken. Uh, You have probably heard of uh, shaken baby syndrome. Terrible thing. But as we come to the conclusion of the tribulation, God is going to take the earth. He's going to shake it. Joel speaks of this, if you'll turn with me, keeping your fingers in uh, Matthew, but if you'll turn back to the book of Joel. Uh, In the second chapter, Joel chapter 2, and notice the 10th verse. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. Drop down to verse 31 of the same chapter. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Go on to the uh, third chapter of Joel and notice verses 15 and 16. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will also roar from Zion and and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And notice that as God is shaking the earth, he hasn't forgotten the Jewish people. He hasn't forgotten that Jewish remnant. Are you familiar with the phrase, everything is coming apart at the seams? The whole universe begins to unravel. The sun and the moon will cease to give their light. And the stars are going to start falling from the sky. It's nice to see a shooting star now and then, but when they come tumbling down, how frightening that will be. And you know, uh, when you are going through something scary and suddenly the lights go out, it becomes even more frightening, even more scary. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. Isaiah also speaks of this in Isaiah chapter 13. If you would want to turn there, please. Isaiah chapter 13. This is not something new that Jesus is telling us. The ancient prophets also spoke of these events that would accompany Messiah's coming. Isaiah chapter 13, and notice the 10th verse. 
For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Turn over to chapter 24 in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 24. And notice the 23rd verse. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Luke says at this event, this uh, solar system phenomenon that will take place at the second coming or just before the second coming, that there will be dismay among the nations and that human hearts will fail them from fear. I'd like you to turn to that passage in Luke's gospel, the 21st chapter. Luke chapter 21. In verse 25, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth uh, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Can you imagine events that are so terrifying, so calamitous that they may literally scare people to death? The Greek term behind uh, failing, men's hearts failing them for fear, it means to expire, to stop breathing, indicating that people may well literally be scared to death by what takes place in the solar system right before Jesus returns. During those days, the one who upholds all things by the word of his power will suddenly grab the universe and begin to shake. The creator and the sustainer becomes the shaker of the universe. The prophet Haggai wrote, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they will come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill the temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The solar system. And now, the greatest event in biblical prophecy, the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24 and verse 30. Then, after the solar system is shaken, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The close of the tribulation, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Son of Man. And remember, Son of Man, as used by Daniel, is a messianic title. He is going to return to earth with great power and glory. Again, this is not the rapture of the church. This is an event that takes place seven years later. This is his return, his revelation. Messiah's actual return to earth to establish his kingdom. The sign of the Son of Man has received a number of interpretations. Uh, some see it as uh, the return of the Shekinah glory. Others think it will be the sign of the cross. Uh, one writer has written, many of the early church fathers, such as Chrysostom and Cyril of Jerusalem and Origen, imagine that this sign would be an enormous blazing cross visible to the entire world that would pierce the total darkness then shrouding the world. Uh, they would take the view, you know, that before the uh, conversion of Constantine, you know, he saw this, had this vision of this cross. Now, there is Christianity and there's Christendom. I'm not convinced that Constantine was converted to Christianity. I think he was converted to Christendom. There's a difference. 
You see, Christendom is external Christianity. Christianity is Christ in you. But according to the uh, historians, Constantine talked about this great vision he had and he converted uh, to at least Christendom. Uh, but, you know, to the tribes, the Jewish tribes scattered across the earth, you see, to Jewish people, the, that symbol that is so precious to us as Christians, the old rugged cross, to Jewish people, the cross can be quite scary. For you see, under the sign or the emblem of the Christian cross, the Spanish Inquisition took place pogroms and persecutions and horrible things have been done to Jewish people under the sign of the cross. And often when Jewish people uh, see a cross, it, it actually causes uh, fear. You see, Christians don't know church history. Jewish people do. And they know what we, quote-unquote, Christians, have done to them. So I'm not sure it's going to be the sign of the cross. Other interpreters suggest it could well be the Shekinah glory. And Ezekiel talks about, uh, you know, when the, when the Lord returns and he talks about how the Shekinah glory moves back to the uh, Holy of Holies and so forth. And, and some think that it may be a reference to that. And certainly in verse 27, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And so they say, you know, there may be, this may be his, his glory, the light, and all of that. But uh, I, I think it just is best to take the sign of the Son of Man as just most likely uh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus is coming. The parallel passages of Mark and Luke uh, simply say, Son of Man, the sign of the Son of Man. The prophet Zechariah gives us an interesting clue. Uh, Zechariah 12 and verse 10, if you'd turn there. Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Keep your finger there, but I want to cover one thing in Matthew, then we'll come back to that. In verse 30, uh, we move from the second coming to the sorrowing crowd. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now back to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. It's a prophetic text that speaks of Israel's redemption and restoration at Messiah's second coming. There is a, and I may have told this story before here at a previous conference, but it, it is well worth repeating. We have a, a wonderful supporting church in Arizona. In fact, I have to tell you, you know, I, I suppose we should look at all of our supporting churches equally, but this, this supporting church is just one of my favorites. I, I go there almost every year, and uh, I just love going there. They have a wonderful pastor. Uh, they love Israel. They love the Jewish people. Uh, we took our Jewish neighbor with us one time to, to this church, and they just loved on her. Uh, she just loved it, and uh, what a church. What a, what a group of believers, and it's called... Strawberry Chapel in the Pines. Isn't that a great name for a church? Strawberry Chapel in the Pines, and it's in northern Arizona, and I'm scheduled to speak there in August, and do you know why I'm going there in August? Because it's too hot in Phoenix. So we're going up to Strawberry. And uh, a few years ago, I was doing a weekend prophecy conference there, a Saturday-Sunday prophecy conference, and, and on Sunday, a, a wonderful Jewish couple that have become friends of, of ours, uh, uh, came to hear me speak, and uh, 
I was speaking on Zechariah chapter 14 and it talks there about Messiah's coming and his return and the couple came out and they greeted me and they said we have a question according to Zechariah 14 you were teaching that Messiah is going to return at the end of this tribulation period to rescue Israel from her enemies I want to make sure we understand that and I said yes that's exactly what the Bible teaches and they said well we, we just we just read that as you were speaking and we want to make sure we understand it and so we talked about that for a moment and I said to that couple I said you know no that's what Messiah is going to do Zechariah 14 he's going to return and deliver Israel at his second coming that's what Messiah is going to do but if you want to know who he is you got to go back to chapter 12 and verse 10 and it says that uh, they will see the one they have pierced now I said to this Jewish couple I said who do you think that is now I got to tell you something Steve verified this the other day my Jewish friends have opinions you know the old saying if you get two rabbis in a room you have at least three opinions my Jewish friends have opinions and usually they have strong opinions in fact my dear rabbi friend he says to me he said Pat you are so kind and gentle he said you know what I was, I was expecting one day just to blow up at you and end our friendship, but he said, you're so kind and gentle, I can't do it. <laughs> I said to this couple, I said, who is the one they pierced? They didn't answer me. I couldn't believe it. They didn't answer me. So I asked them again. They still didn't answer me. So I asked them the third time. They still had no answer, but it was written all over their faces. They knew that this was talking about the Messiah, the one they had pierced. One day, the Jewish people and all Israel will see him as he returns and they will turn to him and Romans eleven twenty six 26 will then come to pass all Israel will be saved there's one other thing the sound of the trumpet verse 31 and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together as elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now this trumpet is not to be confused with the trumpet of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 16, which is sounded to assemble the church age believers as we meet the Lord in the air. That trumpet is sounded before the tribulation. This trumpet is sounded at the close of the tribulation and it is sounded to gather tribulation saints and scatter Jewish believers from the four corners of the earth. They will be gathered. Now these angelic, these angels, these angelic servants are gatherers. They are gathering in the harvest. They are gatherers. But uh, I want you to back up to Matthew chapter 13 because Back in Matthew 13, they're gathering too, but they're gathering something different. Matthew 13. Notice verse 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so note, uh, these gatherers, these angelic gatherers in Matthew 13, uh, they're going to be gathering the wicked. But here in Matthew 24, they're, they're gathering the righteous. Uh, in Matthew 24, let me just point out, I'm going to say much about this because I think Clarence is going to be speaking on it and I don't want to take his thunder. But in Matthew chapter 24, look at verses 40 and 41. 
Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Let me just suggest to you that is not the rapture of the church. That is not the rapture of the church. And I, I know some good people who have written some books and pamphlets, and they are convinced on the basis of those two verses that the rapture takes place at the close of the tribulation. Well, there's a snatching here. But the snatching here is not of the church, and it's not even of, of tribulation believers. The snatching here is of the wicked, and they're taken to judgment. Check the context, study it. I think that will become clear to you. In his study Bible, uh, David Jeremiah announced, uh, writes this, excuse me. He said, in ancient Israel, the trumpet announced important national gatherings. At the end of the tribulation, the sound of the angel's great trumpet will signal the assembly of all of God's saints and the 144,000 Jewish witnesses and their converts. The Old Testament saints and believers who will have died in the tribulation will be gathered out of their graves to join the redeemed. The tribulation starts out ominously but finishes in triumph and glory. Just a few weeks ago in uh, Arizona, our uh, current home, uh, two different pilots claim that they saw UFOs flying over the skies of Arizona. There was another reported sighting near Roswell, New Mexico. These reports received a lot of media attention and uh, many of those people who read those reports uh, buy into uh, UFO and alien theories and uh, well, you know, I, I believe there are extraterrestrials out there, but they're called angels and demons. But uh, there is coming a day where there will be signs in the heavens. The solar system will bring forth unprecedented cosmological signs with the sun and the moon no longer giving light. The stars will fall out of their heavenly orbits and the entire universe will be shaken to its entire core. Then the Son of Man will appear as a sign and as a savior to Israel as Jesus Christ returns in blazing power to rescue Israel from a world that is seeking her destruction. The angels of heaven will appear to assemble the believing saints to gather the believing saints of the tribulation. And now the King of Kings has returned. He has gone to his throne in Jerusalem and under his rule and reign there will be a kingdom of a thousand years and beyond peace, prosperity, and practical righteousness will dominate the entire globe. How can I even respond to such a glorious prospect? Well, I think the answer is found in Psalm 2. If you'll turn with me to Psalm 2, and with this I'll close. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Such is the rebellion of the kings of the earth. But notice God's response. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. And did you know God has a sense of humor? Amen. But the word laugh here is not a a laughter like you and I would laugh. It's, 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 it's a laughter of derision. It's, it's, it's scorn. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. 
Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Kiss the son. When you enter the presence of royalty, the king, the queen will extend their hand and you will kiss their ring. Our president and his wife made some, well, they stirred some things up, I guess, their recent trip to uh, England. Uh, they didn't follow all the proper protocol. Uh, they didn't bow and stoop to the queen, and they got a lot of criti criticism for that, but I kind of agree with my son-in-law, you know, the American Constitution says all men are created equal. And I'm not going to bow to a uh, British queen. That was taken care of in the 1700s. <laughs> but I want you to know, I'm bowing to the King of Kings. His name is Jesus. He's coming soon.